he is risen. Yes, Got to make sure you all stay awake after that breakfast this morning. I'm a little worried about you all this morning. Good morning, Whispering Pines Church, on this beautiful Easter morning. It is wonderful to be with you today as we take some time to remember that we have a Savior that died for us and rose again, that we might be freed from the grip of sin and reconciled to God. 1 Corinthians 15 is sometimes called the resurrection chapter, so let me read from the beginning of that chapter as we begin our time together this morning. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James and then to all the apostles. Would you pray with me? As we begin, Jesus Christ, light of the world, the hope we needed, the the hope we didn't deserve. We thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. We just celebrated on Good Friday the uh, everything that you went through, physically, emotionally, mentally, uh, that led you to the cross, and then the cross itself, the pain of. Nails being driven into your hands, of having to lean up against those nails to take a breath, and of bearing the sin of the world on your shoulders. Jesus Christ, you paid what must be paid. But you didn't stay down, Jesus. Sunday was coming. And we're so thankful, Lord, today that we get to celebrate not a Savior who who once was, a Savior who is, a Savior who is alive and at work, A Savior who loves so greatly that He was willing to give of Himself. Lord, do not let us take Your sacrifice for granted. Help us to think upon Your sacrifice today. And the hope, Lord, that it brings not just for me, but for my neighbor and for the people in my family that don't yet know You. The hope that You are, the good news that You are. Help us to celebrate that today. In Your name we pray. Amen. The Christian story is one of resurrection. It all centers around the belief that God, the creator of all things, perfect and powerful, wonderful and just, sent his only son to die for our sins, to take our place. But not only to die, but also to rise again, giving us the promise of eternal life in the presence of God. Easter is a story of hope. That's what I really want to talk about this Easter Sunday. Hope is the reason for so much of what we do. It's why farmers plant seeds. It's why people play the stock market. It's it's why people get married. It's why we get so excited each spring. It's why I keep rooting for the Minnesota Vikings. It's it's hope. Sometimes Sometimes it's more like wishful thinking, but it's hope. Living in the mountains of Colorado, we have to be a hopeful people. We have to be hopeful that, that, that spring will come, right? We hope for many things in life, don't we? We hope for prosperity. We hope for peace on earth, good health, that our families will get along. We hope for a number of good things to happen. But what's even more important than what we hope for is what we hope in. And that question is what Jesus came for. It's the question he came to answer. The one, and, and one of the most vital things that he communicated to us in a variety of ways, is this. I want you to put all your hope in me. Jesus calls us in his life and in his death to this hopeful trust. A hope that is much less wishful thinking and much more a solid anchor. If our hope is in a person or a philosophy or a job, it will be shaken. Many of you know that better than I do. But if our hope is in Christ, it can be trusted. He told us, John 14, 1, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. 
Matthew 6, 25 through 27. It's part of his Sermon on the Mount. He said, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not your life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? The promise of Jesus is not, and you will, have, and you will never have any more concerns again, or that all of your problems will magically go away. The promise is God will meet you in your need. God will provide all that you need to have faith in him today. God meets our deepest needs through Jesus' death and resurrection. The great hope and promise of the Christian faith is that the work of Jesus is sufficient. I can't add to it and I can't take away from it. All that there is for us to do now is to receive it. To be made right with God, reconciled to our creator. So central is the cross for Christians that it is through the cross that we see everything else. It's how we make sense of the rest of life. C.S. Lewis famously said that I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. What you believe about Jesus affects the way you see everything and everyone. My identity is impacted. How I serve as a steward over God's creation is impacted. How I see you is impacted by what Jesus did on that cross. If Christ alone has the power to save us from our sins, if that's true, then I ought to carry a burden, a desire for others to know that powerful truth. If that's true, then kindness toward any other person, kindness to the cashier at the grocery store, to a coworker or that family member that I'm not getting along with, that person that just cut me off, cut me out in line. That kind of kindness isn't an inconsequential act, but it's perhaps among the most important things that we could ever do. For it is God's kindness that leads us to repentance, we're told in Romans. It's seen most visibly at the cross and at the resurrection, but now, church, it's manifested in us as we are instruments of God's kindness and revelation to the world. If Christ died on the cross, not just for me, but for all, then my life has to be a lot less about me and my personal successes and a lot more about making his love and forgiveness known to as many people as I can. So today I want to tell a story. It's got three parts, three acts, if you will. Act one, scene one, Genesis one, verse one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. There's beauty in this scene. The picture is maternal, like a dove hovering over its nest, waiting for something, not just to be created, but to be born. We were brought into this world with great joy and with big plans like any parent has for their children. We're told at the end of Genesis chapter 1, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. And on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. God creates this beautiful place for us. I've never known that as much as I've known that living here. He's created this beautiful place for us. And we know the story. We know Adam and Eve's story from 
He made it from nothing. From nothing, God made everything. And he creates this suitable place for his creation to live. Notice something, though, that we don't always think of. Chapter 2, verse 2 says that God had finished the work he had been doing. There were some notable things that were not finished, that were not done at that moment. God gave Adam the opportunity to name the animals, we're told, to create further order and to tend the garden and to steward and have dominion over the land and to do all of that with God. God invites Adam and Eve into the story. Adam and Eve then were doing what people were made to do. They were like forklifts lifting forks. I love that expression. Living up to their exact purpose. It didn't take long to move on to, chap- to act, chap- act number two, the fall. In chapter two we read, and, then, and the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will surely die. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 reads, Now the serpent was craftier than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree of the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so they did. They ate the fruit and their eyes were opened. But what they saw made them sick. They saw that they were naked. They knew that they had disobeyed. And so they hid and and we've been hiding ever since. They hid by sewing some fig leaves together. We hide in a very similar way, actually. We just keep inventing more and more elaborate fig leaves. It's not always close. We call it success, acceptance. It isn't just about having the right clothes, but the right house, the right job. How do you cover your sin? We have to get really creative so that You don't see any problem at all in me and I don't see any problem with you. It's just safer that way. God knew immediately. Elaborate costumes are of no use with him. And so God punished and exiled them. He punished them in kind of an interesting way. God's punishment was not like a a beating or a spanking that would would hurt and then be soon forgotten. God cursed their work. Genesis 3, 17 through 19. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground since from it you were taken. For dust you are and to dust you will return. Professor Brian Gray, a professor at Denver Seminary, so that the first act of redemption God ever enacted was to curse the work. By this act, humanity would not be allowed to fully find meaning and purpose in what they do. From a people living out our precise purpose, forklifts lifting forks, humanity, this side of heaven, will never find complete satisfaction in what we do. We would always feel a void in us, a need for something more, a purpose greater than our own. We all feel it. Even the irreligious feel it. It leads humanity all over the world to look for God because we can never be satisfied. And then God exiled Adam and Eve from the garden. What does it mean to be exiled? To be exiled doesn't need to mean anything more than to not be home anymore. Have you ever felt that way? But God did not give up on his creation. He continued to work through humanity. God worked through leaders and prophets, continually calling people back to himself. And we kept right on hiding and medicating. We're good at that too. Medicating doesn't always take a substance either. We medicate through escape, differentiation, disassociation, 
getting lost in our work, busyness. There's a lot of different ways we've learned to run in the opposite direction. It wasn't just some sinful world out there somewhere that was failing. It was the people of God that turned their hearts away from Him. They complained, they disobeyed, they lied and cheated, they worshipped idols, they were completely broken. A lot of time passed. We didn't listen to the prophets. We weren't inspired by the kings. And so God did what God alone can do. Mark chapter 1. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and he was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. This Son, born of God and of man, would show us how to live. He was tempted and tried by all the same things that we face, but he overcame sin. He did so much more than preach and teach. He healed people. He spoke his words like plain men sing. He walked on water. He gave the religious leaders every reason to fear him because he spoke as one who had authority. Jesus was Lord, God in flesh. Shortly before his crucifixion on the cross, he changed into the garb of a servant and began to wash the feet of his disciples. He washed the feet of Judas, the man who would betray him. He broke bread and shared wine with them so that he was foreshadowing something, a a greater sacrifice. And then Jesus was arrested. And though he could have denied the charges and freed himself at any moment, he did not. His disciples all left him. He was beaten He's bloodied. He carried his cross as far as he could and then they crucified him between two common criminals where he died. Jesus was not the first man claiming to be Israel's long hoped for Messiah. Many had claimed to be the Messiah and were killed for their blasphemy. But three days later, more people began to follow this Jesus more than ever before. Three days later, his word was true. Three days later, Jesus rose from the grave. Why? Why did he do it? Romans chapter 5, 6 through 11. You see, at just the right time, at just the right time, when we were still still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone may possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but Also, we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Jesus' death on the cross was the only act that could ever make us righteous. It is not by our righteousness, our faith, our goodness, our good works that we could ever be saved. Lee Strobel adds to the conversation. He said that Jesus Christ did not come into this world to make bad people good. He came into this world to make dead people alive. Jesus did not come to teach people how to be slightly more kind. He did not come to make us incrementally more holy. That's what we do. That's what we do. That's what the church sometimes thinks we're supposed to do. That's what self-help books promote. But that isn't what the Son of God came to die for. He came to make dead people come alive. He came to make the most wretched, the most leprous, the most promiscuous, the most selfish, blameless in the eyes of God. He didn't come for anything less. To illustrate that for you, I'd I'd like to tell you one more story this morning. 
Matt Chandler today is a very well-known pastor of the Village Church in Flower Mound, Texas. But before Matt Chandler was Pastor Matt Chandler, he was just a guy. He still is just a guy. Um, but he was just a guy who, who cared a whole lot about an unbelieving friend of his. This young woman, Matt's friend, had a sordid past. She was a sinner. She was broken. And she did not want to step foot into a church. Because she was confident about what she would find there. Judgment. But Matt was excited because he had convinced this young woman to come with him to, to hear a very famous Christian speaker at a conference. And Matt was thrilled that she had agreed to come into her, her first Christian event in years. The pastor, and the, sorry, the, the preacher, started his message with a rose. He took a rose and he passed it through the crowd and he encouraged everyone in the crowd to take a good smell of that rose. Smell its wonderful fragrance. And by the time the preacher had passed, uh, had, had, had finished his sermon, the rose had made it all the way through the crowd. And the preacher took the rose back and, and, and by now, some petals were missing. And the stem was, was bent. The leaves were all taken off. It wasn't all that beautiful anymore. There wasn't much left in that rose. It had been passed around, handled, smelled, by everyone. See, the preacher was trying to make some kind of point about purity and morality. The preacher said of the rose, look at this thing. Look at this thing. It's pathetic. It's been passed around. Everyone's handled it. It's, it's no good anymore. It's bent and broken. It's missing petals. I mean, who would want this rose? Who would ever love this? Matt Chandler thought in his heart, Jesus does. Jesus wants that rose. Jesus loves that rose. Even though it's been passed around and broken and bent, Jesus wants that rose. And he proved for us that he wants that rose when he died at Calvary. Easter changes everything. I don't know where you're at with Jesus Christ this morning. I don't know how you're feeling. Maybe you've been passed around too. Maybe you've been, maybe you've been doubting your worth. Maybe you've, maybe you've been mistreated. Maybe you've been judged. Jesus wants you. He loves you. If no one else will, He will. He does. So let me close. I once more reading the words of Romans 5. You see, at just the right moment, when we are still powerless, unpeddled, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Would you pray with me? Jesus Christ, I, I stand in an, a room uh, full of people who are not good enough. Uh, as the prophet would say, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. This is what we do when we encounter Jesus on the cross. Son of God come to die for people that are not good enough. We find you still loving, still giving, merciful when the world is not, loving, choosing, redeeming, even when the church fails to do so. Help us, God, to be a more loving people because of what you've done. Help us, God, to let go of our sin and our shame. Jesus, thank you. Thank you, and, and, and also thank you is not enough. 
Uh, don't let us just be people on the sideline at a football game cheering on God that, that you would go and do. Lord, you invite us. You invite us to be instruments of your kindness, ambassadors of your cross, that people might know you, that people might be redeemed. Help us, Jesus, as people who have all felt like failures, who have all felt unpeddled and imperfect and not good enough. We have fallen short. There is no one, no one who does right. Jesus, you do right. You do right, and you have done it. You have done exactly what we need. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the resurrection. Now help us to live in light of those things every single day. In your name I pray.